In this video lecture, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about taking notes. I'm going to start by talking about why you take notes, how taking notes in graduate school is different from taking notes in undergraduate, then I'll talk about where you should be taking your notes and how you should be taking your notes. And then I'll end with uh, some examples of how I take notes, both digitally and by hand. So let's get started. So why do you take notes? For me, there are two reasons why someone would take notes. First of all, critical engagement. And when I say critical engagement, I mean that when you're listening to a lecture or you're reading an article, after about five or ten minutes, you're going to start spacing out. And so by taking notes and interacting with the information as it comes in, you keep yourself connected to what is going on. The second reason is personal knowledge management. And when I say this, well, what do I mean? I mean that we often have the misperception that experts have all the information they need right here. And they can just call it up at will. That's actually not the case, right? An expert needs to be proficient in far more knowledge than he or she can hold in their head. And the way that they do that is that they have assembled their a database, a personal database of information over time that they can access when they need to access it. And that's what notes are. It's your personal knowledge database, right? For personal knowledge management. Now, all of that stuff actually might sound rather obvious to you because it sounds like the reasons you took notes in undergraduate. Um, but I want to draw some important distinctions between undergraduate education and the notes you take there and graduate education and the notes you need to be taking here. Now, when you're an undergrad, like I said in class, the professor comes in, you listen, you copy down what they say, there's an exam, you maybe study your notes before that exam, you copy that information onto the exam, and then those notes go into a bookshelf or maybe into the garbage and you never uh, look at them again. Now that's not going to work in graduate school. Why? Because first of all, as a graduate student, you're expected to be not just copying and listening, but interpreting information as it comes in. And the other thing is, you know, in undergraduate, you're probably taking a bunch of different classes, and they may or may not relate to each other. Whereas in graduate school, you're taking a bunch of classes on a single discipline, and you need to start connecting all the things that are happening in those classes, and all of the things that are happening in those individual articles over time. And so uh, you need to be using your notes to be connecting information, building your own personal web of information. And then finally, you need to use all of that information applied in your professional life, whether you're going to be a professional translator or an academic. All of this information you're going to be using again, not just at the exam, but next year, uh, five years from now, and ten years from now. So graduate notes are mm, about doing more interpretation, about making deeper connections, and about setting a system into place that's going to serve you over the long haul. Now let's talk about where you take notes. And let me just preface this by saying, you know, if you're still taking notes in that uh, notepad that you got for HBKE orientation, that's not going to work. Why? First of all, you need to be taking your notes in a place where you won't lose them. If you're taking your notes in a notepad like that, pages are going to fall out. If you get handouts from class, you're going to shove them in there, but then you're going to throw it in the back of the car when you're driving home, and then they're going to fall out. And oftentimes, those notepads that you get from orientations or, I don't know, from signing up for a new car insurance, people don't give them much importance, and then they end up at the bottom of piles of other papers, and then they end up in bookshelves, or you just never see them again. Uh, the other thing is you need to make sure that you're keeping your notes in a place that is accessible and that has a flexible format. When you're taking your notes in those notepads, it's just page after page after page. But as I was saying before, you need to be able to access and reorganize that information uh, depending on new situations or depending on different projects. So you need to be keeping your notes in a place where you're not going to lose them and where they're easily accessible and where you can mm, change the way the information is organized based on the needs of the moment. Now, how would that actually work? Uh, where do you take notes? Well, one thing that I would suggest is that you get a three-ring binder. Why? Because you can take notes on individual pieces of paper, you can put them in the binder, you can reorganize them, you can add handouts, you can add uh, articles, you can add all sorts of other information, and then let that information reorganize and evolve as your knowledge evolves or as new projects come up. Um, you might also think about taking your notes digitally. Um, one tool that a lot of students use is Evernote, one tool that I use is one called Dev and Think, and both of these allow you to put together text documents, images, PDFs, links, 
and then organizing them uh, using notebooks and tabs so that that information is flexible, right? And so that you can search and reorganize that information depending on the reason you need that information. Now, we've talked about where you keep your notes. Let's talk about how do you take notes. For me, there are four elements that good note-taking should have. The first thing is good notes should document where the information comes from. You're going to be coming across a lot of articles, book chapters that are in edited volumes, or research monographs, and you might not have the chance to come across that information again. So you need to quickly capture it, and you need to quickly capture where that information comes from so that you can cite it in your papers. Or, if you need to go and find it again, you can go and find it again. Uh, the other thing is you need to deeply process essential information. And I want to focus for a second on deeply and essential. Now, when I say deeply process, I'm talking about the videos that I recommended you watch by Stephen Chu, right? It's interacting with that information as it comes in. Now, the second part, essential. Uh, a lot of students, when they first start off in translation studies, they go, I don't really know what's important. And that's true. If you're new to the field, it's going to be hard to know what's important because everything seems important. And part of becoming a scholar is uh, slowly developing your knowledge base. And as you develop your knowledge base, it will become clearer to you what that essential information is, either based on your sort of general understanding of a field or maybe uh, given a certain project that you're working on. So it's always important to deeply interact with that information and don't worry so much about the essential right now, you will develop it over time. Now the third part, you need to make sure that your words and thoughts are clearly delineated from the words and thoughts of the author that you're taking notes on. Why do I say this? Because oftentimes you take your notes, um, you're interacting with what another person is saying, and then you come back to them a week later or two weeks later and you're not sure what you've said and what they've said. And sometimes that information can end up in a paper, it's not cited correctly, and then all of a sudden you have an issue of plagiarism. So it's always very important to make sure that you know what it is that you've said and what it is that they've said. And then the final element to good notes is that you really need to make connections to prior information. And information that you've read in previous articles in this class but also information that you are absorbing in your other class. For instance, um, how does our conversation about genre relate to the conversations about genre and text type um, that you're having in pragmatic translation? Or this week I've asked you to uh, read an article, uh, a study of um, volunteer translators for TED Talks. Is there any way you can connect that information with, say, the information you're reading in Monday Maybe you can relate it to Holmes's map. These are the sorts of things that you need to be doing in your notes. So document where the information comes from, deeply process the essential information, differentiate your words uh, from others' words, and then make sure you're always connecting it to what you've learned before. All right, so I've talked about how you take notes. Let's talk about how I take notes. I'm going to give you two examples. The first is going to be a digital example, and I'm going to show you how I use what's called the Zettelkasten system to build my own personal uh, knowledge database. And then I'm going to show you a handwritten system called the uh, Cornell system for taking notes, you know, on paper. So let's get started with that. Now before I talk to you about the Zettelkasten method, I want to just show you uh, this. Um, because one thing that I do when I'm dealing with complicated texts, like very long texts, before I start taking uh, detailed notes, I often make a mind map of the ideas that I see developing in a text and that way I can go back and I have uh, like a skeleton on which to hang my more detailed notes later. So if you're dealing with a complicated text you might think about doing something like a mind map either using uh, a program or just you know writing it out on a piece of paper. So with that said let's go to the Zettelkasten method. Now the program that you see right in front of you is DevonThink. And in my Devon Think, it, well, it's a database, and it's full of a bunch of different text files, okay? And each text file contains what I see as one main idea in a text that I am reading. Let me show you one example. So let's take this uh, literary timekeeping example. Now this is what the text document looks like, and I want to show you what are the various elements uh, when you put together an individual Zettelkasten file. 
The first thing is each file has its own unique number and its own unique title. So that way I can easily reference to it and uh, uh, distinguish it from other notes. The second thing is all of my notes very clearly delineate uh, the sources that I'm using and the text that I'm taking from other sources. You can see that when I have text from other sources, I either put it in uh, quotations or the other thing I do is I put it in what's called block quotes. And anytime I cite another author, I'm using these what's called in-text citations or parenthetical citations that have the uh, date of the uh, work or the last name and the date and even the page number of the work I'm referencing. So that way I can distinguish what they've said from what I've said. And uh, the other thing I did is I actually bolded things that I think are especially important. And then after I have all of the content that I want from that article, I then begin to connect it to other uh, things that I've read. So in these little subsections, I connect it to other readings that are in my Zettelkassen database. And then I also connect all of the other files that I think relate somehow to this file. After that, I then have tags. And that way I can search, you know, everything that's on Mexico. I can then search my database for everything that's on Mexico. I then have the main reference where I got all of the information. And then all of those other ideas that I connected, all of those other people I've cited, I have all of those citations right here. So again, when you're using the Zettelkassen method, what you want is to make sure you have a unique identifier at the top. You want to make sure that you distinguish what you're saying from what they say. You want to make sure everything clearly do is documented, the citations where you uh, got the information, and then you want to connect it to uh, the other things that you've read. And you can do that just by, you know, free writing. You can do that by listing the other related sources. And then finally, you need the tags and you need the references, main reference and the other reference. So that's how I take uh, notes digitally. Now that we've looked at a digital method of note-taking, let's look at a handwritten method. And again, this is the Cornell system. So for the Cornell system, what I need to do is I need to divide the piece of paper into thirds. First I take the bottom third and I just section it off. And then I take a, a third here on the side and I section that off as well. Now, when I take my notes, what I do is I take my notes here in this large section that remains. So these would be, uh, you know, notes as they come. I might draw a little diagram here. I don't know. And uh, when I'm done with that, what I would do is I would go back and anything that I think is a key point or a key subject, I would put it here, right next to where that content appears. And that way, when I go back to these notes, I can very quickly uh, understand what they're about and then access the relevant information. And then the final thing that I would do is along the bottom, I would write a summary of all of the information here on the page where I connect it to previous notes. So that would be where you would make those deep connections. And that's the Cornell method. You do your uh, sort of detailed notes here you do keywords here, and then you do summary and connections here at the bottom.